Uh, good morning, everybody. You might wonder why FERC and the Corps are teaching a course together, and we um, we do a lot of things together as part of the four federal agents, four, four federal dam owning and regulating agencies, um, us, um, FERC, TVA, and the Bureau of Reclamation. I think we probably have more common with uh, what FERC is doing. Their policy matches ours um, really closely. It has a lot to do with, so I think between Doug and I, we've written all of the FERC guidance or been part of all the guidance has been written in the industry for a long time. Um, we felt like we had a lot more in common uh, than than we had that were different for the uh, when we're doing semi quantitative risk assessment. So this course we actually teach together because there's about 85% overlap uh, of what we're doing and what uh, FERC is doing for uh, risk assessment. So um, we've structured this course several times as a course feedback form. We'd really like you to fill it out. Um, we've changed it this course every time after every time we've taught it. Uh, so we do appreciate your feedback when we're going through. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, give a quick introduction, and then um, I'm going to handle logistics, and then we'll get started. So my name is Nate Snorlin. I'm the director of the Risk Management Center for the Corps of Engineers. Uh, behind me is Doug Boyer, uh, the Root and Branch Chief uh, for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Tom Williams, um, a Geotechnical Engineering Program Manager for the Risk Management Center, and Andy Hill, another G uh, Chief of the Geotechnical Branch for the Western Division of the Risk Management Center. Um, so why are we all here? So um, FERC and the core are changing how we look at safety. We've, over the last 15 or so years, transitioned from a standards-based organizations to a risk-informed organizations, or two risk-informed organizations. And so as we do that, we're changing how we um, evaluate safety. Um, so FERC's licensees and our sponsors and our consultants that support both of them are really critical to that process and, and how we use risk to evaluate safety. Um, so this is one of the fundamental training courses for dam um, and levy safety for both agencies. So a little bit of background, there's a lot of information on the Risk Management Center's website um, and the FERC's website is about things, you, tools you have for, to uh, do risk. There's a lot of references. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of information you can find out about risk assessment, about some of the background of how we got to where we're at. Um, so I encourage you to go to the RMC website. It changes a lot. Um, there's always information added to that. Um, this is where you find out about training. So there are other training courses available. Um, you can always go there and register. Um, it's where I also have to uh, distribute our tools and software, the things that we'll use to actually calculate the risks that you'll see today. And then there's a reference library um, that get, goes to all the core, really, but it, um, there's a lot of information on there as well. If you want to do some self-learning, we have a YouTube channel, you say it's Risk Management Center, you can go there, you can, every training course we have that we've done has a video and, uh, and the slides and everything like that in the workbook. So you can go there, uh, do some self-learning. Um, they're not bad, actually, I've, I've watched a couple of them. Um, so today, I'm gonna give a quick overview of risk, and then uh, Doug and I are gonna walk you through the FERC and the CORE's risk guidelines. I'm gonna give an intro to semi-quantitative risk assessment, which is the core of this uh, course today, and take a break. And then we're gonna talk about the PFMA level two risk assessment, SQI process for both agencies. We're gonna do a PFMA exercise. After lunch, we're going, or in during lunch, we're gonna select, we're talking about selecting and making a team, do an exercise on that. We're gonna talk a little bit about how FERC and the Corps document the results of the risk assessments. Uh, after the break, we're gonna talk about how FERC and the Corps use it, use all this information and give an example in Q&A. &A. And we've done a pretty good job of staying on time so far. Um, but, uh, at the end of each module, we encourage you to ask questions, so uh, uh, we're happy to help. So what we'd like from you out of this course, or for you to have out of this course, we'd like you to be able to know what risk is for both agencies should be able to describe the evolution of risk in the industry and then explain how the core and FERC use risk. And then you should be able to identify the general approaches of how we assess risk. So what is risk? Um, risk is everywhere. So uh, there's financial risk, there's project risk, there's business risk. I think if you Google risk anywhere, you'll come up with um, probably the biggest one is financial risk comes to the top. So there, it's the, the nomenclature is everywhere means different things to different people, but it's really embedded in every in everyday life. And so there are a couple of ways as we kind of get closer to towards dam and levy risk, there's a couple of ways we look at risk. You can look at risk either suddenly, right? You die in a sudden accident or um, 
dosage over a lifetime. So that could be radiation from nuclear, it could be um, carcinogens for the Food and Drug Administration. So those are two kind of different ways we look at risk. Um, but there's a website called Mechamorts that talks about your most likely way to die. And um, today, you're most likely to die from heart disease, and you're least likely to die from kangaroo attack. So I'm pretty feel pretty safe about the kangaroos today. Um, but it, it's, it's in every industry. It's in every facet of life. And so we spend a lot of time um, trying to normalize those things. Um, but the bottom line, and we've done a lot of research into this, is the essentials are the same. Um, the definitions vary across industries and across organizations, how they look at it, what they talk about it. The terminology, honestly, is a mess. Um, risk means different things to different people. It's defined differently, but um, we're at least internally consistent in the dam and levy safety industries. But um, for simplicity, um, the Federal Risk Management Guidelines, which is a, a publication of the four federal agencies, um, defines risk like this. The likelihood of a structure lo being loaded, which is we all refer to as the hazard. The likelihood of adverse structural performance given that load, which we all often call performance. And the magnitude of the resulting consequences. So those are the three components of risk that the federal agencies have defined. And so hazards are pretty typical. You know, have a pretty good handle on that. It's usually floods or earthquakes or landslides, something that loads a structure. Performance could be a structural failure, but also could be misoperation or adverse performance or damage, right? So that's not the, so the performance set can be defined in different ways. And the consequences, so we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go on today, but um, you can find that any way you'd like as well. Lives, property, environment. We tend, we, uh, the agencies tend, are focused on life safety primarily, but we also look at economic consequences, environmental consequences. So talk a little bit about the history of risk. And I'll say that no matter what industry you're in, the reason that risk was adopted as the framework for either how they're regulated or how they're assessed it came from a disaster of some sort. It could be the Piper Alpha incident in the North Sea in 1988 that led to a lot of the OSHA-type uh, regulations in the UK. It could be the flood disaster in the Netherlands that caused several thousand people to die that led to what they did. Um, could be a variety of things, but really... Um, dams and levees are no different, right? So uh, the reason that the federal agencies have been migrating towards risk management as a regulatory framework and as an assessment framework for an owner is that um, there are several series of failures that ca was capped by the, the failure of Teton Dam in 1977. And then Hurricane Katrina um, capped another like series of failures um, in 2005. And so those two events really led to the agencies uh, transitioning to a more risk-informed process. And so. This happened a lot of a lot of places. Anybody um, in here read the Health and Safety Executive's document called "Reducing Risk, Protecting People"? It's a really good document. It's about seventy pages or so. It really forms the framework of what we'll, both FERC and the core use for both our terminology and the frameworks for how we're approaching risk assessment, risk management, and regulatory guidance. And so, it's really well written. It was written following the Piper Alpha disaster. Um, so again, coming out of the disasters, a lot of the a lot of the framework you see for you is some of the stuff that goes in HSC it also came out of the nuclear power industry, both from the UK and the United States back in the 60s and 70s. And then some of the information you see comes from the Netherlands, um, from the Delta Committee, which was formed after the 1953 flood disaster. So, so a lot of genealogy comes into the into the frameworks that both agencies are using right now, and that's a little bit where they came from. Ultimately. That led to the guidance you see that we're going to use today. So on the left, uh, the four agencies got together and wrote the federal guidance for dam safety risk management. And I'll tell you, it was a little rough process. It took about four years to write that document, mostly just to try and see what we had in common to make sure that we are managed things in common ways. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a bit. Um, but if you have not read that document, you should read it. It, it outlines the guiding principles that go between that the, the federal agencies have agreed on between all of us. Uh, the second document is uh, FERC's risk-informed decision-making guidelines for dam safety. And then there we have a dam safety regulation uh, for the core and levy safety regulation for the core. So ultimately, all those things led to the, forma or the uh, development of these four documents. So let's talk a little bit about how the agencies use risk. So for the core's perspective, we use risk to make safety decisions, right? So if we own a piece of infrastructure, we use it to make safety decisions. If we don't own it, but we regulate it, and that really means, for the most part, 
um, levies that are owned and operated by somebody else but are in the federally authorized system, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, we act as a regulator, and so we use risk to make regulatory decisions. Um, we use risk to prioritize uh, the work we're doing. It's usually capital investments for core-owned facilities. We also use it to inform budgeting for, um, for also for core-owned facilities. Um, we also try and help levy sponsors and who own structures that we regulate um, make good operation and maintenance priorities. Um, we also use it to make operational decisions and we use risk several times during events, during floods and disasters to make operational decisions. And we, one of the core's mission is to manage flood risk and we actually do use risk assessments to do that. Um, from FERC's perspective, uh, FERC uses it to inform its routine activities, whether it's inspections, instrumentation, or monitoring, emergency action plans, or other things. I use it to prioritize dam safety studies and actions, and then more, most importantly, probably you're all here, is to inform regulatory decisions. So why do we transition to using risk for dams? Um, back through the 70s and 80s, there were a series of failures that were happening, even for structures that were designed to modern standards, and that was a little bit concerning for the uh, federal government and for the regulatory agencies. Um, if you looked across the agencies, treatment of hazards was very inconsistent. Um, whether it's earthquakes or, or floods. And there was no incorporation of the consequences of what was gonna happen in anything. Um, so we felt like uh, risk analysis dramatically improved our understanding of structural performance. And I'll just say that that's probably the key aspect of why, we, why we've why we adopted risk, which is we feel like we have a better understanding of how the structure performs using a risk-informed process versus just a, a standards-based evaluation of safety. The levees, um, it's a very similar story. Um, over the last 25, 30 years, there have been 155, 154 levy failures. All those structures were designed to core criteria. Um, I'll say that the biggest issues with that are seepage and piping and riverside erosion um, after overtopping. Um, and again, same, same thing. We feel like using a risk-informed process is helping us understand those structures better and helping us make better safety decisions. All right, so let's talk about the general approach to how we're going to approach risk management. So this flow chart you see on the left um, is something that the four federal agencies agreed on that we could all follow in general. So you'll see a flow chart that doesn't look necessarily like this, but it contains these fundamental concepts in every agency's guidelines. Um, I'll tell you, just because we're with the core, I have about 87 more acronyms and 200 more boxes on that sucker, right? But but it does follow the general process. And the general process looks a little like this. There's an outside loop, which we call the routine loop, and an inside loop, which I'll call the non-routine loop. And this is periodic assessments for us, uh, periodic inspections for, the, for FERC. This is uh, where we do routine risk assessments every 10 years or so. So this is uh, kind of the routine activities we have just, to, just as an owner uh, and a regulator. If we find we have some sort of incident, and that could be some sort of thing we see, or we, we during one of our routine assessments, we flagged something that looks a little concerning. Um, we go into the inner loop where we're trying to decide a couple of things. One, do we, do we actually have a real issue? And if so, what do we do about it? So that's really what happens in the inner loop. Um, this chart on the right, I'll just highlight the green boxes are probably the most important part of this. It's the building blocks of how we do risk assessment, no matter what agency you're, you're in. Failure modes, potential failure modes, which we have a lot of section on that today is the building block for everything we're doing. So a failure mode assessment combined with estimating risks, we call a risk analysis. A risk analysis with an evaluation of those, those calculated risks, we call a risk assessment. So those, and the risk assessment is where the decision happens for all the agencies. So those fundamental building blocks of how we look at risk and how we define risk are written in the, in the green boxes. That's also, both these charts in the Federal Risk Management Guidelines, all four agencies reference this in their individual policies. So there are three basic types of risk analyses we do. Um, at the bottom level, um, we have screening, and this is really a qualitative sort of assessment. You don't really put any numbers in. People in, for the, in the course um, uh, process, which we typically do, this is the levy screening tool for us. Um, users select choices from pre predetermined menus. You don't get to calculate anything. Uh, the loading is usually predetermined, and the consequences are sort of predetermined. It's, the intent of screening is to have something that's very consistent, slightly conservative, um, but that users don't, and don't end up having a lot of choices in how the, how the results look. 
focus of what we're here today is really the next level. Well, um, mostly when screening is done, it's done in a very agency perspective. I know we don't spend a lot of time um, hiring a lot of consultants to do that, and it's not there's not a lot of other people doing screening. Some quantitative risk assessment is different. Um, it is where we first introduce failure mode. So if you're doing screening, it's more like failure categories. It can be defined a little bit differently, but when we get to semi-quantitative risk assessment, that's where we tr transition to failure modes based analyses. Always consists of a facilitated risk team and subject matter experts. And then the loads and consequences can be done in a variety of different ways. Typically, I think for both agencies right now, they're done by advanced teams. There's a team out there that does the hydrology and does the consequences, and then they do the risk assessment. But it doesn't always have to happen like that. But the bottom line is there's a lot more attention paid to the loads and consequences for, for SQRI than there's for screening. And then at the high end, um, we do quantitative risk assessment. And so these are detailed studies based on failure modes. Again, it's a, an extension of SQRA. Again, facilitated and usually a higher power group of subject matter experts are there. And then facilitated actually guide teams through the loading and the system response and the consequences. There's a lot more involvement with the loading teams and the consequence team on the per on the behalf of the risk group that's actually doing the risk. So it's a lot more detailed. So um, typically we do quantitative risk assessments and if you're just quantitative risk assessments, we're trying to evaluate alternatives. So there's some key components that go into the risk assessment. One is we have some engineering information about a project. We have some information about the hazards and we have some information of the consequences. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to scale the risk assessment to the importance of the decision. And so scoping risk assessments is an important thing to do. Both agencies spend a lot of time doing it. Then we calculate the risks, we calculate the nature of the risk, we calculate the, we look at the tolerability of the risk compared to the ages of the agency's guidelines and determine the next course of action. That, that fundamental component, that five, five bullet list right there, really summarizes every aspect of what both agencies do when we're doing a risk assessment. So, what you're going to see for the rest of this course is we're going to give you an introduction to the SQRA process. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the core and FERC and how we select teams to do these things. Uh, we're going to give you an overview of what we expect teams to do to prepare for a semi-quantitative risk assessment. We're going to give you an overview of the PFMA process used by both agencies. We're going to give you an overview of how we estimate risk for SQRAs. Um, we're going to talk about how the core and FERC document risk assessment results and findings, and then we're going to talk about how both agencies use the results of a risk assessment in their either regulatory or ownership uh, perspective.